John Heideracker is Heideracker, sorry, is the president of the Minnesota-based think tank, the Center of the American Experiment, and he writes on the excellent Powerline blog. He joined me a little earlier today from Minneapolis. So, John, great to see you. Uh, you live in Minnesota. Now, is this one of the blue states, or could it possibly be a red state? Tell us about Minnesota, John Heideracker. We're definitely not red. A Republican <laughs> presidential candidate hasn't carried Minnesota since Richard Nixon in 1972. But you know what's interesting? Um, polling here is getting quite tight. And Joe Biden's campaign has just announced that tomorrow night he's going to make a campaign stop in Minnesota, ah. which is really interesting because he only leaves his house about every third day. He <laughs> doesn't basement. make many campaigns. He's he got a basement many... he can stay at in uh, Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he won't have a crowd. You know, he'll come to Minnesota, but he'll give a, a talk reading off a teleprompter to an empty room with three or four reporters, probably. But it's really interesting. That, that he feels like in the last days before the election, Minnesota is one of the states that he needs to visit. That makes me suspect that his own polling uh, isn't looking all that great here. Well, of course, John, uh, we've spoken before uh, on Outsiders about Minnesota and about uh, the whole Ilan Omar, the uh, radical Antifa demonstrations and riots, et cetera, et cetera, over the past few months. How big a part has all this played in, uh, do you think, in the American election? Well, I think it plays a big part. Uh, you know, the, the way things have gone in recent elections are on the countryside is bright red. You know, it's very Republican. That's true in Minnesota, but it's true all across the, the country. The urban areas are pretty consistently blue, and the suburbs are tend to be the swing districts. And uh, one thing suburbanites don't like is riots, arson, looting, and a lot of people are wondering how big an impact that's going to have. It's certainly going to have some. Uh, now, we've also seen, John, today some extraordinary figures to do with the uh, American economy, 33 percent figures, GDP, this sort of thing. Um, Trump has always boasted that he has the greatest economy, and it was that until uh, coronavirus came along. How, do you, how are people in the states reacting to these figures, and will it help Trump, or is it too late? Well, it certainly should help Trump, uh, but it might be too late. Uh, I, I don't honestly see a lot of reaction. You know, in a normal election cycle, Rowan, if you had this kind of economic growth and if you had peace, and among other things, bringing peace to the Middle East, you know, exactly. I mean, a very, very successful foreign policy, Trump ought to be winning in a landslide. And yet, you know, the COVID uh, epidemic and the shutdowns that the governors have imposed, the impact that that's had, uh, have, have really put a different complexion on the race and I think have made it a lot closer than on paper it, it deserves to be. Uh, now, you mentioned foreign policy. Uh, there's debate about how much foreign policy does play in American politics and in American elections. But it was fascinating to hear uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo uh, yesterday talking about the fact that he was basically saying that China uh, is responsible for the suppression of all religions. And he was speaking to an Islamic audience in a Muslim country when he was saying this, but he was referring to all religions, uh, Jewish religion, uh, Christian religion, obviously, Falun Gong and others, and saying that China is the great uh, atheist, if you like, that suppresses these uh, religions. What did you make of those comments, John, and will they resonate with uh, Middle America or particularly Christian America? Well, he, well, number one, he's certainly right. I mean, we got, what, a million Uyghurs in concentration camps, and the Chinese have been suppressing Christianity for, for a long time. So, so what he's saying is certainly true. You know, honestly, Rowan, it's hard to tell at this point what moves voters. I, you know, I, I think to some extent um, it, that might help with, with Muslim voters. To some extent, it might help with evangelical Christians. 
But there's such a divide right now uh, in America between the pro-Trump forces and the anti-Trump forces, which basically represent the establishment. You know, Trump isn't really running against Joe Biden. He's really running against the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, CNN, MSNBC, uh, really the, you know, the, the universities, uh, the, the public school systems. Uh, he's really running against the establishment. That's kind of how it breaks down. Uh, and last time he ran against the establishment, he won. So do you think the same? Uh, we hear a lot about the enthusiasm. We see the pictures of the Trump rallies, fantastic. Uh, we hear about uh, uh, Trump cookies selling out and Biden cookies sitting there, <laughs> sitting there going moldy <laughs> on the shelf. I mean, tell us from your point of view on the ground. Obviously, no one knows. But uh, the enthusiasm factor, do you hear that resonating in the streets and people who don't really follow politics? How does it play out? Well, it's it's amazing, Rowan. You know, the, the old Groucho Marx line, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes, right? <laughs> the pollsters tell us, the pollsters tell us Joe Biden is ahead. My lying eyes tell me that there's nobody outside his immediate family who seriously wants Joe <laughs> Biden to be president. You know, you, we see, you know, Trump goes out and he speaks to tens of thousands of people. They can't get in, but they line up anyway, just to wave at Air Force One as it flies over. Overhead. Joe Biden does a campaign appearance and no one shows up. I mean, literally, he can't get people to walk across the street to see him. And it isn't just the campaign events. We have spontaneous things like boat parades during the summer and, and truck parades going down highways on behalf of President Trump. And there's 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 an Amish buggy parade supporting <laughs> President Trump. I mean, they, they always say once, once you've locked in the Amish vote, then that's, <laughs> you know, you're, you're laughing, you're, you're home and dry, aren't you? <laughs> aren't you John? Yeah. I mean, you know, so, so my lying eyes tell me that all of the enthusiasm is on behalf of the president. And, and if Joe Biden is going to win this election with just rarely even leaving his house, uh, not really making a serious effort to campaign. I'm going to have to see that to believe it. Uh, so let's fast forward uh, to the two outcomes. Let's play very briefly the sliding doors game, assuming what is going to be the reaction, and I'm thinking particularly of riots, of violence, of the media, uh, what is going to be the reaction, A, if Trump wins, and B, if Biden wins? Well, you know, when Trump won four years ago, the Democrats never did accept it. They immediately went into this resistance, as they called it. They considered him to be an illegitimate president for some reason, any reason they could think of. And so it's hard to say if he wins again, this time will they accept it? Uh, I don't know. I think they'll feel chastened. I mean, they've spent the last four years trying to get everybody to hate Donald Trump. You know, that's been their mission. And if they fail, I, I, I suppose there'll be a little bit of rioting here and there, but, but uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, th I think maybe the second time around, they might accept it. Now, if Joe Biden wins, uh, you know, the Republicans are just not constitutionally set up to, 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 you know, refuse to accept the outcome of an election the way the Democrats did in 2016. So I don't think we're gonna see anything quite like that. I do think a lot of Republicans haven't forgotten and won't forget how the Democrats treated uh, Donald Trump for the last four years. And I do think that if he wins, Joe Biden is, is going to be in for some tough sledding. How, I guess the question if Biden wins, how far left will America be dragged? The thing you really need to watch, Rowan, is the United States Senate. Right now, the Republicans have 53 out of 100 votes in the Senate. So the Democrats need to take either 50 or 51, depending on whether Biden wins. If Biden wins, the vice president presides over the Senate and can cast a tie-breaking vote. So they need to pick up three or four seats to take control of the Senate. If the Democrats take control of the Senate and keep control of the House, as I think everyone believes they will, and if Biden wins, now they can do pretty much anything they, they want. And so the first thing that they'll do, if they have the votes, and they might need one or two extra votes, because there might be one or two Democrats who won't go along, but if they have the votes, they will abolish the filibuster in the Senate, and then they will pack the Supreme Court, they will add several seats and, and appoint left-wing judges, they will admit Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia as states, and they will legalize something like 12 million illegal aliens and give them the right to vote. 
That's their plan. And if, and, and if Biden wins and if they have the votes in the Senate, that's what we should be watching for. Well, that sounds like the nightmare scenario. And speaking of which, uh, John, I mentioned earlier, tomorrow is Halloween. Uh, I guess the next <laughs> test after the cookie test is uh, how many people are wearing uh, Donald Trump masks going door knocking and how many are wearing Joe Biden and Kamala Harris masks. That might be the real. <laughs> that might really tell us which way the nation's leaning.